Hallmark Hotline, what is your emergency? All right, well, we're back from spring break. We hope all of you DPS students had a great one. Um, either you, if you want to tell us what you did over the break, anything fun? Um, I went to Moab in Utah. What did you do, Sam? I also went to Utah, and I'm really excited about it. And I was actually going to pull up a picture to show you guys of me in Utah that I have Ooh. a good one somewhere. I did um, not go to Utah. Why we, didn't you go to Utah? You're wrong. This is, this is me in Utah, uh, right. stemming over oh my uh, gosh. Uh, through a, a slot canyon. <laughs> Holy mackerel. Um, so I did a bunch of slot canyons while I was in Utah. Um, I'm really into doing this. This is a, a hobby of mine. I used to do a lot of hiking in canyons, but lately I've done more technical stuff. So um, this was a canyon that was pretty easy, but there was a long stretch of pool uh, that to avoid, you know, walking through the pool or having to swim through the pool, you could just stem along it. And so I probably stemmed for something like 50 meters, 100 meters. Um, and I, I had my backpack on my stomach there. Balance. Because oh my no, gosh. because I started with my back up against the rock and my feet yeah. up against the other side, because okay. of the way that the slot was, you know, back behind where the picture starts. Uh -huh. That was the most convenient way to start. But then as I got going, and that's a little bit slower, I was able to open out and stem. But my backpack was already there. I wasn't, wasn't going to switch it at that point. Yeah. No. Um, then your backpack's in the water. Yeah. You yeah. Go in there after it. And then you've got nothing. It's a mess. I was going to show. I was going to show this one more, not to not to make the show all about me in my life, but. Um, <laughs> Oh this, my gosh. I got to do a really technical slot called Zero Gravity Canyon, um, where we swam through all these different slots, and then at the end, we got stuck at this part. I got stuck at this part where, uh, on this side where my, my uh, arrow hand is pointing here, I was, uh, I'm just a little too big to fit through uh -huh. this section of slot right here. My buddy, who's very thin, uh, could barely fit through this section. And what I had to do was go up over to the choke stone that you can see, that's this rock stuck here, um, drop down onto it, and then come down the other side of it. And it's one of the harder moves I've ever pulled. I did it totally off rope and just did it all on my own. And You and got no choice, I guess. I wow. didn't have much of a choice. And <laughs> it was really great. And, and my friend, when he went under the chokestone, had rigged a hand line on the chokestone. So when I got to it, I was able to pick that up from the chokestone and then use that and kind of walk off the chokestone and use that to give me some tension to fall down. And it was just a really great, huh. exciting, oh my gosh. exciting really time. Cool. So, so yeah, just that wanted really to, cool. to share with you guys. I have a picture, too. All right. We're sharing pictures. Yeah, so I think we are. One. Let's just make this really a show where share. we share pictures. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there's in, that's in uh, Canyon Land. Oh, that's Mesa Arch. Yeah, yes. That's yeah, cool that's in Canyon Land yeah, in that's Utah. An so island in the sky. Really, really, really cool place. Really, really impressive. So. Isn't that wild the way the cliff just drops away right there? Oh my gosh. When you walk up to it, it really is. Where, where Beck is sitting, just like a few feet in front of her, it's just a sheer cliff. It is. Just like it it's is across the, the, exactly, the valley Exactly, exactly. It was um, straight down. So being afraid of heights is not an option <laughs> there, I don't think. Nope. Utah, so much fun. Utah's amazing. Yeah. Who knew? <laughs> well, what did you do? Um, I, mean, I skied a couple days. I don't have any pictures on me. No um, pictures? No, no pictures of you skiing? We I ski did, all the time. I did. For a uh, couple minutes, think my friend might have died. Oh, <laughs> well, geez. for a couple minutes. Your friend is okay. Or I thought he was like seriously injured Jeez. because we did a hike up. And, Tatsuya. Yeah, he took off down before I did, and oh, then when wow. I got to the drop-in spot, I couldn't see him. Yeah. And the only place that I wouldn't be able to see is past a huge outcropping of rocks that Ooh. he tumbled over, but somehow managed to only hurt his shoulder a little bit. Oh, oh geez. So kind of lucky. lucky. Now. Well, I'm really glad he's really okay. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Oh, my gosh. I'm glad you guys had good spring breaks. Yeah, yeah. me Definitely too. Definitely restful and wonderful. Exciting stuff. Well, even though I kind of wish I was out in Utah still, uh, we are back and ready to help you with math, science, or English questions. Call us at the number listed above here, 720-424-1667, uh, with your questions. You can call us on Tuesdays and Wednesdays from 4.30 to 5.30 p.m. And I'm going to actually correct that. My, my sheet says 1667, but the actual number is 1666. I did think that was weird, but I was looking at my script, and I thought, we must have, yeah. we must have changed it. Got a new number. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. Well, you can watch us on our Comcast channels 22 and our new high-definition channel 882. Prism TV channel 8007, Facebook Live at EG Homework, or Livestream at Livestream.com. Um, and go to Discover, then put DPS TV 22 in the search box. And you can also see past shows and segments at our YouTube channel on Denver T DPS TV. And the show is sponsored by the high schools where you both teach. Um, 
Becca and I <laughs> teach at Emily Griffith High School, <laughs> and Sam teaches here at Contemporary Learning Academy. So Sam, I hear today is Science Demo Day. Yes, no bones about it, Nathan. Uh, we are going to have a science demo, uh, so we'll be talking about fossils in about uh, a half an hour here. So why didn't the dinosaur run away when he saw the human? I, I just don't know. Anyone? I don't know that one. He was too petrified to move. Wow. Uh, <laughs> uh, good one. <laughs> so that joke, it sounds like it came Wait, from social media. <laughs> or did you get that off of Laffy Taffy? That is a popsicle joke. That's a yeah. popsicle, popsicle joke. quality. Popsicle stick quality. Um, no, it sounds like it came off of social media, actually. <laughs> okay. So we know you like social media. <laughs> so you can also send in your questions through social media platforms, all the platforms. We have Michael looking out for your questions on our social media. So, Michael, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you are doing here on Homework Hotline. I would uh, say that is definitely a social media joke. Uh, <laughs> I'm Michael. I'm an intern here at DPS, and I'm also the social media master today. So I'll be uh, answering your question or giving them the questions to answer for you guys today. Uh, I'm also the trivia master today, so I'll be giving you your trivia question here at the beginning of the show, uh, and then we'll address it again later on, and then at the end of the show we'll give you the answer. Uh, today you have a chance to win a prize, which I believe is still some symphony concert tickets. Mm -hmm. So today's trivia question is, what African country served as the setting for Tatooine in Star Wars? Ooh. I love that we've got a Star Wars trivia question. I know. Yeah, it, it's also the last week for the uh, Star Wars exhibit at the art museum, so if you haven't gone. Oh, geez, yeah. Definitely yeah, there. Go. Check it out. Yeah. Yes, for sure. Well, we did mention that you can get in touch with us on all the social medias, so let's give you all that information. Um, you can catch us on Facebook or Twitter at EG Homework. That phone number is always going to be on the top of your screen, by the way. Um, you could text questions to us, not at the number on the top of your screen, but at 970-680-3771, or you could email us your questions at homework at emilygriffith.edu. So those are all of the wonderful ways that you can get in contact with us. Um, that's to either answer the trivia question or to get your help from, for your homework. So let's go to Michael at social media and see what we have waiting. All right. So we're going to start off with the math question here. Uh, it is an absolute value question. Uh, the absolute value of x to the power of 2 minus 6x plus 1 equals the uh, absolute value of 3x plus 5 divided by 2. And okay. you're supposed to solve for x. Apparently this person struggles with absolute values. And absolute values are very tricky. I Actually, it looks like a pretty tricky one with the uh, quadratic inside of it. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to be solving absolute values and quadratics. Probably. Possibly. We'll see mm -hmm. how this one plays out. Um, I will talk about really briefly. I've got the equation on my screen. I'm going to maybe... Maybe make this a little bit. Actually, you know what? I'm going to write it out without the, you know, it's really hard to type out uh, and read math notation sometimes with our regular keyboard. So I am just going to write out the equation um, where it looks a little bit more normal. Um, so the first thing I think we'll talk about is we'll talk about absolute values first just to have an idea of how they work just because it seems like the person who is asking this question is having issues with the absolute value idea as well. So um, absolute value, what that means, and I guess we'll break that down first, is the distance from zero. So we're always talking about distance. Um, that even works in coordinate, coordinate planes where we are um, two-dimensional. So we're same thing, we're talking absolute value is distance from the, the origin or from zero. So a very simple absolute value question, I'll kind of show you this, is be very simple here, is the absolute value of negative 3. What that means is what is the distance from 0 of negative 3? And you think on a number line, if I've got, here's my 0, negative 1, negative 3. Negative 3 is 3 spaces away from 0, so the absolute value of negative 3 is Three, because it's three units away from zero. Um, I'll give you an absolute value equation first, just to, to give you an idea of how this works. So let's say I had the absolute value of x is three. 
So that means what number could x be that it's going to have a distance of 3 away from 0? Um, and what happens with that is we know that we just saw that negative 3 has a distance of 3 away from 0, but there's also another value that has a distance of 3 from 0, and that is 3. So 3 is 1, 2, 3 spaces from 0. So absolute value equations often have two answers. We have the answer and then it's opposite. So when we're solving more complicated equations like the one above, we need to consider that the absolute value of whatever we're solving for is going to be equal to whatever's on that side, but it's also going to be equal to the opposite of whatever's on that side. So we need to consider both situations. So when I go to solve this equation, I'm going to, um, as I mentioned, consider both. The first situation I will consider is just the regular without the bars. So that the fact that these two will just, they just will equal each other. The other situation, and I'm going to leave myself some space here, is that I need to consider that the absolute value of my first is going to equal the opposite of this. So make this negative as well. Just like my 3 and negative 3 scenario. It equaled 3, but then it always also equaled the opposite of 3. So I have to consider both situations. Um, so that means I'm going to have, I'm going to leave some space down here, x squared minus 6x plus 1 is equal to, and I'm going to negate everything on this side. So do the opposite of that. Again, this is just like what I did over here. So I have two equations that I need to solve for, and I'm going to have two solutions. So um, going from there, I'm going, to, I'm going to go ahead and set this equal to 0. This is a quadratic equation. I'm not going to really get into um, depth, and I could talk, I mean, my class does quadratic equations for a whole month on how to solve them, so I'm not going to get too in depth on, um, I guess, the theories of solving them and, and the methods of solving them, but the way that we're going to use today, uh, it looks like, because our numbers are kind of messy, is the quadratic formula. Um, and the quadratic formula requires you to get your equation to look like this make it equal zero in general form. So that's what I'm going to start out doing, is I'm going to, to make my equation equal to zero by subtracting 3x from both sides. So that gets me closer to zero. I have a 9x over here. And again, I'm not getting really into the nitty gritty of how to or why this is. But So I'm going to change this 5 halves. I'm going to change that into 2.5 just because Maybe a nicer, easier number to work with a little bit. Depends on your thoughts on fractions. And then we're going to say that this is x squared minus 9x minus, oh gosh, minus 1.5 is equal to 0. Um, so from here, I'm going to need to do the quadratic formula. I'm going to save that, though, because we'll do that together with both of them. Um, so I'll save that, and then we'll do the same over here. We'll get it so that I can get, get it ready to do the quadratic formula. All I'm doing, again, is I'm getting it in this. And this is called general form. Set equal to 0. So I'm going to do that with my second equation. So I've got, um, over on the right-hand side, what I want to do is I want to distribute this negative sign. And um, that will end up getting us negative 3x and negative 5 halves. And let's go ahead and change that to 2.5. Negative 2.5. And then over here, I still have the same. I didn't do anything with that. And then same thing. I'm going to make this equal to 0 by doing the opposite on my right. I'm going to say plus 3x on both sides. Oops, gosh. And then plus 3x on this side. So then over here, now I have x squared minus 3x plus 1 equals negative 2.5. And then same deal. I'm going to go ahead and do the opposite here. So plus 2.5 plus 2.5. So I end up having x squared minus 3x plus 3.5 is equal to 0. So these are my two equations that I'm going to need to do, use the quadratic formula with. So all I did really... Um, in between these two steps is I did, I did a lot of algebra to make it into general form. And I've got two equations that I still have to solve here. Um, so in a separate tab, I'm going to show you what the quadratic formula is. 
let me maybe explain it briefly. So if an equation is written like this in general form, and I've had students try to do this a lot, um, try to isolate x. Usually that's our theory when we're trying to solve equations. Well, you might notice there are two terms with an x in it, with a variable in it. And so that makes it very difficult to isolate it. It's possible, but it's difficult. And so what the quadratic formula is, is all of the steps were taken to isolate that x with our equation in general form. And here's what happened. It was, we got this. Negative b plus or minus b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. That's if I did all of the steps to isolate x in this equation up top, I would come out with this. And so what we do is we use that quadratic formula almost as like a shortcut. Let's not do all those steps to isolate x. Let's just plug in our coefficients a, b, and c since somebody solved it for us. So back to, um, oh man, let's see if I can get there easily. There are a lot. We don't delete our stuff here. So I need to get to, oh my gosh, I need to get to 50. So my first one was x squared minus 9x minus 1.5. So let's go back to, oh gosh, wrong one. 51 minus 9x minus 1.5 equals 0. So here's how this works. And I might just run it with this one for time's sake um, and not the other. Um, because it works the same way and you just are going to watch me doing the same thing. I might leave some work to you guys, actually. <laughs> but here's how it works, is we're going to start by identifying our a, b, and c coefficients. So a, b, and c. So our a here is actually kind of hidden, and when it's not written like that, it's understood that it's a 1. Our b here is negative 9, and don't forget to take the signs with it. It's a common issue. And then our C is negative 1.5. And so, negative 1.5. And so all I do at this point is I plug in. I just replace. I replace my variables. I'm going to say x is equal to negative b, so negative, negative 9, that's my b, plus or minus square root of b squared, so negative 9 squared, minus 4 times a, which is 1, and times c, which is negative 1.5. And that's going to be all over 2 times a, which is 1. And then from here, we just have to simplify. I know, again, this seems like a lot, it's a lot of steps. It's not really terribly difficult, but it's a lot of steps. So I've got negative negative 9, which is now going to be positive 9, plus or minus. And then I have negative 9 squared, which is 81. And then minus 4 times 1 times 1 1.5. So we get positive 6 over 2. And just continuing that on, I have 9 plus or minus the square root of 87, which is not a nice one, over 2. This is where I'm going to grab handy dandy calculator because the square root of 87 is not super nice number and we're going to estimate at this point so I've got 9 plus or minus and the square root of 87 was 9.327 over 2 now I'm going to have two answers for this so I have 9 plus 9.327 9 and then divide that by 2 which gives me, so 9 plus 9.327 divided by 2 is going to give me 9.163. And then I also have to do 9 minus 9.327 divided by 2. So 9, oh, I want to get an accurate answer here. Square root of 87. And then divided by 2. So then we get negative 0 0.164. So these are two solutions. There will be two other solutions as well. Um, let me go back to the page. I'll just show you this. I'm not going to go through it again. Um,
but that was the, those were the two solutions to this part of the equation. There will be two more solutions to this part of the equation, but you solve that one the same way that I just did the other one with the quadratic formula. I'm not going to run through it because I don't think you need to watch it. In fact, I just think that you need to practice. So that is how to solve that problem. Big idea though, remember for absolute values, you just, you have two parts of your equation. You want to set it to the positive and you want to also set it equal to the negative or the opposite because of the way absolute value works. Seemed pretty simple and straightforward. Yeah, no big deal. <laughs> no big deal. Yeah, that was, that was epic, but really well done. That was a pretty yeah. epic problem. <laughs> I think that might be the first problem that you, anybody's used two tabs on. Two I know, I realized that. I'm like, this is going to be this, the two this tabber. Is just too, too much. Oh, an old two tabber. <laughs> <laughs> but we did it. That's what we're here for. Yeah. All right, well, let's go back to Michael and answer some more of your questions. <laughs> All right, thanks, Becca. Um, in honor of opening day, it looks like we have a very interesting baseball science question. Uh, why does a knuckleball seem to dance towards home plate? Definitely. So I'm not the uh, most sporty of people in the world. I like sports. <laughs> Are uh, you sure? <laughs> ish. I saw you climbing that rock. <laughs> Oh, those kind of sports, I'm totally into. <laughs> we didn't see him throwing a rock. Organized yeah. ball, <laughs> team, <laughs> jersey sports that I just yeah. tend to not be. I mean, you know, I, I love that other people love them. It makes me happy that they make other people happy. Um, but but um, so I, I guess what I'm just trying to say is I'm not uh, super deep into an understanding of, of knuckleballs and their strategic use in baseball, but I have a general understanding and I can at least talk about the physics behind them. So um, with a lot of different uh, ball sports, right, uh, players want to put different kinds of effects on the ball to get the ball to do things besides fly in a straight line. So a really common example of this is in soccer, right? A, a, a kicker on a penalty kick uh, might want to get around a wall of players blocking the goal. And so if they can put a, a significant curve or spin uh, to make the ball curve, uh, they, can, they can make the ball move around the wall of players blocking uh, the goal. Um, so things like that are, are done in baseball as well. Uh, you've heard of like a curveball. Uh, Curveballs are, are essentially the same as a curveball in soccer. Um, but in any case, uh, what, we're, what we're looking at is uh, in a knuckleball, you've got a much different type of throw going on. Knuckleballs are slow, and, and whereas with a lot of different things that are done with balls, you want to put a lot of spin on them. Uh, in the case of a knuckleball, you want to put very little spin uh, on the ball. Uh, so if we could jump to my screen really quickly. Um, this is uh, a diagram that actually is, is more used to show how golf balls fly through the air, but it'll serve uh, our purposes. You can just sort of see the difference shown between the airflow on uh, a smooth ball and then the airflow on a golf ball. Side note, the, the divots in golf balls create a little bit of turbulence uh, that allows, you can see uh, this air pocket here, the wake pocket that's created, to be more narrow on a golf ball, uh, which means that the golf ball has less drag, which means that golf balls can fly further. That's a little bit unrelated to what we're talking about, but just looking at these airflow diagrams, just thinking about the way that there's this kind of laminar flow that goes around a smooth ball, you've got to imagine now with a, with a baseball, we don't have an entirely smooth ball. So let me just show right here. Here's somebody uh, holding a baseball um, in, in sort of the knuckleball pitch grip. Um, uh, you can see that they're using their, their uh, fingers to hold it in sort of a strange way, and they're actually just going to push the ball forward. In an ideal knuckleball pitch, you actually don't want the ball to rotate more than about a half rotation as it moves toward the plate. But again, just looking back at this, this diagram that shows the smooth airflow, or the airflow over the smooth ball, you can imagine that parts of the baseball um, are just like this, and so that, that smooth uh, that, that slow pitch will fly smoothly through the air until the point when uh, one of these uh, stitches here, where's my phone? Oh. One of these stitches here uh, knocks into the airflow and then that's going to create a pocket of turbulence. And, and the ball will, will do what's called braking in the direction of that pocket of turbulence. But because uh, the, the stitches are, are uh, uh, stitched on the baseball in sort of a curved pattern, um, you can have sort of irregular moments when a stitch will hit or, or, or not hit, and so it can be very difficult for a batter uh, to know what to expect with a uh, knuckleball. Um, and I just, I have this GIF um, that we'll just show here. Um, you know, a knuckleball, and I can probably blow it up a little bit because that's probably small on your screen. This is a pitcher for the Blue Jays. Again, I'm not a big baseball person. R.A. Dickey. R.A. Dickey, thank you. Um, so uh, you can just see, and it, it, it's hard to see what uh, was referred to in here as the dance. But um, from the perspective of the, of the pitcher, 
Um, it, it appears as though the ball is, is breaking in an unexpected direction. You can see it sort of rise unexpectedly there and then drop quickly. Knuckleballs also being slow pitches uh, tend to drop quickly at the end, um, which can also throw a batter off. You can see that the stitches are not moving. And yeah, the, the other thing is that you can see, and I don't know how well spinning you can pick it up, but you, you see that it. there's it's just that very slow spin. And it's hard to, to notice, but there's this moment when uh, it kind of happens right there. You get this upward left, uh, from our perspective, a break up and to the left, um, which is sort of unexpected. And then it pitches downward and to the right. So you'd expect it to, if it's going to go that direction as a curveball, you'd expect it to continue that way. But as a knuckleball, it can pitch right back the, the other direction as soon as the stitch moves out of the way of the airflow and reduces that turbulence. So um, yeah, knuckleball, really effective pitch is my understanding because it can throw batters off so much. Uh, on the other hand, one of the most difficult to master, they say. Yes, there's, yeah, it looks really hard. there's only three pitchers in modern baseball history that were knuckleballers. Tim Wakefield, R.A. Dickey, mm -hmm. and then uh, a young kid who pitches for Boston now um, as well. So, wow. Yeah. Well, R.A. Dickey now plays for the, uh, the Braves. Oh, he now plays for the Braves, but he was playing for the Blue Jays at this time. Is that right? Okay. Okay. All right. Well, let's go get more of your questions answered. More questions answered. I know. <laughs> We're actually, I think we need to head into commercial and then get to. Oh, we got to do oh, a science yeah, experiment here. Science experiment. Yes. Oh, all right. Science about experiment. That's even all better. right. Yeah, cool. So. Well, we'll see you soon for our science experiment then. Hi. All right. Well, welcome <laughs> back to the uh, science lab area here. Um, in my continuing quest to just make uh, the science demo uh, an opportunity for Nate, Beck, and I to eat something, um, we're going to be doing fossils uh, today. And we're going to be looking at fossils, sort of creating a, a, a fossil demonstration. And it's an edible fossil demonstration. OK, so guys, uh, we got a little bit of time before this chocolate solids up here. I need you to help me create the prehistoric landscape. Absolutely. Okay. So these the tectonic plates? These are actually, we're just going to call this the, the rock layer that's already been deposited. OK, so what I need you guys to do is create a layer of graham crackers uh, right. on the floor so of this pyrex. On the so uh, we're just going to imagine, you know, so, so uh, thinking about fossils, what we want to think about is the environment where the fossil was deposited or, or, or formed. Um, and how that formation took place. So we're going to imagine that the, the graham crackers are just a, a normal earth landscape floor, and we're going to add some uh, things to fossilize. So um, we have some edible things and then one non-edible thing. So um, we're going to add some gummy worms, which we're going to we're going to pretend they're titanoboas, which are like ancient gigantic snakes. Oh, nice! Like the most frightening land-dwelling creature ever to live. Will you guys spread the titanoboas out? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Very exciting. So we want to get lots of different opportunity for fossil. Oh, yeah. And let's get this out of the way so we can get a full, oh, a full effect for our viewers at home. All right. Oh, so you guys yeah. can see. So I'm actually just joking about titanoboas. The, the mm -hmm. uh, gummy worms are just going to help us. So they'll, they'll be something we can fossilize here and sort of see the effect of, of fossilization. Um, I just have this really cool student that was telling me today about titanoboas. Huh. Gigantic ancient snakes. Sweet. Um, these are non-edible dinosaurs that I'm going to have you guys set around. Go ahead and just uh, you know, put them in some different places there. Um, and then when we actually eat this thing, guys, you're just going to have to be careful not to. <laughs> when, we, when we excavate, I should say. Don't eat the dinosaurs? You can excavate and eat the, the titanoboas, but not the, not the uh, gummy bears. And then finally, I thought we'd add a few uh, you know, ancient rock boulders to the landscape because you know, landscapes tend to have boulders all around. So I got us a variety of nuts to represent boulders on the landscape. So Nate, you Pour can just. Pour in there. Yeah, let's just, you know. This looks like a great ancient landscape. You can just see <laughs> dinosaurs this are just is exactly what it loving like. it. They're frolicking mm -hmm. all throughout the land. <laughs> da, da, da. It's begging to be eaten. Yeah. Um, so, and and when we when we think about fossil deposition, we'll talk a little bit more about this in a second once we've actually deposited these fossils. Um, but what we what we need are an ideal set of circumstances where we get what's called quick burial of fossils. So we're going to quickly bury um, these fossils by imagining a couple different. Uh, um, events that might have taken place, okay? So let's start with, let's start with that all these dinosaurs are dead, okay? Um, they, they passed <laughs> away from some freak incident, it could have been a disease that ripped through the dino and titanoboa community, and they're all just dead and lying in this area. Now, if they're left exposed to the oxygen, they're all just going to decay and die. But they happen to live near the beach, 
and we're going to create some like sandy dunes that roll over them by pouring a little bit of peanut butter onto them. <laughs> now, I, uh, we're just going to pretend this is right sand like blowing over, but really I know it looks like Sam, you got to tell me what beach you go to. Yeah, I know. <laughs> sand, right? Right? <laughs> peanut butter. Uh, oh, that's like, su Delicious such a great beach. beach. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Delicious. Blowing chocolate. So yeah, we'll just <laughs> pretend that's it. I was really hoping to get the peanut butter more flowy. Um, but I got all natural peanut butter, which is just, you know, it's one of those things. You go to the grocery store, buy all natural, you regret it later because it doesn't work in your science experiment. But we're just going to pretend like some of that area was covered by uh, sand blowing in from the sand dunes. That's something that could happen relatively quickly. And then I have uh, flowy candied chocolate uh, to represent. Now, now, here's the thing. Ideally, what we would do is, is some kind of sediment deposit, like we would do lots of something like sand, or I was thinking about grinding up chocolate to make like a chocolate powder. But we want it to set in time to actually see this. So what we're going to pretend is that there's a volcano right nearby, and we get very quick lava flow that covers up our dinosaur. So who wants to be the volcano? Oh, me, me, me. I feel like me. Becca <laughs> definitely yeah. the volcano. So Volcano Becca is just going to totally cover the landscape in... Uh, you know, chocolate Chocolatey rock. goodness. Chocolatey oh, goodness. Oh, yum. <laughs> All right. So, so Becca, if you could just completely. Oh, this volcano smells so good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is, a, this is one of the nicer volcanoes around. Oh, yeah. Look at that stuff. So as we get this uh, going here, what we're going to do is I'm going to pass this uh, landscape off to one of our producers off on the side here. Um, he's going to stick it in the fridge for us and have it solid up a little bit and we can actually pull the fossils out of it later. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about, about how fossils would be exposed. And then in the meantime, what I'll do is I'm actually want to show you guys some real fossils Ooh. that I brought from home. Wow, um, my roommate is a paleontologist and so we have a really incredible collection of fossils at my house. So I'm kind of lucky <laughs> in that sense and I just wanted to show you some. You just get to like, just to hang out to... with fossils all day? I just, yeah. There was this one time when we used to have a, 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 the footprint of uh, uh, something related to a brontosaurus, I think it was, oh, wow. um, just oh in our living room, a gigantic rock that was the footprint of that. That's pretty awesome. Waiting to go to a museum for research. Oh, I guess this is <laughs> trash. So let's uh, yeah, right. just lava pass this off right to my producer there. here. No fear. Mm -hmm. All right, the magic of television, guys. Mm -hmm. um, so, and then while we're doing that, uh, Becca, could you carefully hand me that box behind you? Filled with oh. fossil art. Or... Perfect. All the way across, here you go. This off, so oh, yeah. Yeah. Chocolate on the bottom. And what we'll do is I'll hold these over here and I'll pass them up and then uh, Nate and Becca, since you're probably in the best position, I'll have you guys uh, hold them up for the camera here. <laughs> so okay. let's make sure I'm not blocking anything. Um, okay, so um, there's different types of fossils, right? And, and uh, maybe the most basic one is the one that we're going to sort of make with our uh, uh, chocolate demonstration, right? Mm -hmm. So we've got these little dinosaurs and worms, right? They're going to get covered in chocolate. And when the chocolate hardens and if we were able to you know, open it up and pull out the, the dinosaur or the worm, we'd be left with essentially a mold of that uh, uh, creature. Um, so uh, molds, uh, and, then, and then what fills the mold, so if you have rocks fill the mold, that would be something called a cast. What I have right here is, which one, this is my e echinoid, so this would be like a, uh, a sea urchin type creature. And you can see, if you look right there, you can see the shell of the sea creature that's uh, preserved all around it, and then um, it's been filled in from the inside. So we have uh, essentially a, a mold and then the cast is the stuff that filled in on the inside. So this is just the, the cast. Yeah, and it's just, it. and if you've seen so, like a sea urchin, it's just the body of it without mm -hmm. all the spikes. Yeah, yeah. that's cool. Kind of neat, right? Um, now, great. one thing, and let's look at another one here. So, so again, we think a lot of times as fossils about, uh, of fossils as being imprints. Mm -hmm. So we, we're hopefully gonna see some imprints of the things that we left in the, in the chocolate peanut butter mess. Um, what, are, what are these? I think you guys should be able to tell, and then maybe you can show the camera. Uh, leaves. leaves. Yeah, those yeah. are ancient leaves. Um, so are, the, are these actual leaves? Those are actual preserved leaves. Well, so um, what those are, those are the hmm. imprints of leaves, and then the leaves were there, right? But then something happens to um, fossil remnants uh, or, or the remnants of organisms as they're fossilized. Um, their cells are replaced by minerals in a process called permineralization. So what we have there is minerals that have replaced those leaves mm -hmm. and left essentially the cell structure of the leaves intact in the form of minerals. Um, so you can imagine if, a, if a leaves like that were to be buried underground, water could seep into that area, and that water mm -hmm. would have some minerals in it. And those okay. minerals would just start to sense. fill the holes in the living organisms. Pretty cool, right? Yeah. yeah. Really All cool. right. 
So we've got a couple others to show you here. Another uh, uh, really great kind of fossil you can see, especially in the West, is petrified wood. Mm. So you guys can see here, and maybe show the camera for me, um, you can very clearly oh, see like, it, the grain of the wood. It's a rock. But though. it's a rock, right? Like you can hmm. feel that this is, this is not light like wood, right? And that goes through the same that. process, right? Yeah, so, so petrified oh, wood yeah. has to be permineralized. So you've got the, the cells of the tree, uh, the parts of them being replaced by minerals themselves. And it's, it's cool because you can really see that ancient uh, 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 grain of the wood, but every bit of it, or, or the vast majority of it, has been replaced by uh, minerals. Yeah, you wow. can, um, it almost looks like bark on the back side. Yeah, it really does. does. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah, it's pretty great, right? Um, so this one's kind of cool. This is a bivalve. Um, so this is, uh, again, the body fossil uh, of an animal. Um, do you guys know what a bivalve is? It's uh, like a sea sponge? Like a, a clam, actually. A clam. More like clam. Yeah. So you can see these are actually the two sides of the mouth. of a gi It's a gigantic bivalve that would have... I don't know the exact size of it, but much Wait, larger these, than that rock. Where's the sides of the That's map? like a cross section, right? Like yeah. this would be like the opening there. Oh. Do you see that? And so yeah, that's this and this. Bivalves are shells that have, are, are sea, sea creatures that have two shells. So how do you think they know, I mean, if you just found this piece, or is it just a yeah. piece of a bigger, how do they oh, know Oh, I'm that's so glad you asked bivalve. that, Nate. So yeah. um, folks like my roommate, who are paleontologists, oh. are really well studied in the, the morphology and history of these things. And they look, so, so you have to think back in the day, paleontologists were looking for any analog to modern life. Mm -hmm. So if they saw something that looked like a bone, they could relate it to uh, a bone that they might have found that was fossilized. Bivalves that we see today, there's structures in bivalves that we see today that mimic the structures that we see there. Okay. I'm not a paleontologist, so the, the finer details escape me. Um, but my roommate, Kate, with very little uh, uh, information other than just the visual piece, can often make good predictions about what kind of an organism you have. I guess that makes sense. If you're very well trained, you have a good eye for that, you would immediately see that. Whereas I just see this as kind of a. Uh, right, it looks like a just a pretty. A pretty it's like yeah. a nice rock. <laughs> right, like yeah. a nice thing in the rock. <laughs> well, here, let me show you. So then we've got some. So these are gastropods. These are uh, fossilized gastropods. Um, so we've got a planispiral gastropod that Nate's holding, and then a, what are they called, a trochospiral gastropod that Becca's holding. Trochospiral is kind of the classic uh, uh, snail shell, and then Nate's snail shell is sort of flat, or it, it moves, it spirals yeah. along a single plane. Um, yeah. So those guys are a little bit tiny there. Um, okay, these ones are really cool, but again, kind of hard to, to see. Um, so these are dinosaur bones. What? Um, yeah, so we don't know exactly what kind of dinosaur bones, um, but they have, uh, you can see sort of the outer part of the bone, and then you can see, if you look in here, uh, this is sort of the inner part of the bone that would have been remineralized. Again, hard to, hard to see. Right. Yeah, if I yeah. just ran really across this in, in nature, I really would just be, oh, You would oh, just think it was a rock, rock right? There's yeah, I'd probably rock. chuck it across a lake and, and see if I could often, skip it. <laughs> <all time. laughs> yeah. That is often my experience with these things. You know, Kate has to point, my roommate Kate has to point out to me what exactly I'm looking at and seeing. Um, but I can see here that this area, so bones are spongy on the inside, so the spongy in, inner part of the bone would have been filled in with minerals. Uh, mm -hmm. the minerals would have been deposited and turned into rocks there. And then you would have the outer part of the bone remain. So this is actual Still, bone. And yeah, this it would does be, feel uh, like. The, the porous inside that would have been refilled. Um, it's funny because when I think about dinosaur fossils, I think of this giant, like, femur bone or something. Like, that's yes, very obvious, absolutely. But and, like, a lot of the time. of years are going to. Yes, and, and there, there are those kinds of bones, and originally that's what fossil hunting was, is it was finding the really obvious ones. So mm -hmm. is this still um, bone on the outside, technically? There's at least still uh, molecules of the minerals that made up the bone, but some of those minerals may have been replaced with rock minerals like silica. Um, so there's not much of the uh, osteoclast, I guess, would technically be the right term. There may be a significant amount of it left. I don't okay. actually know. Um, these are ammonites, which are spiral-shelled uh, creatures. You can see there, again, uh, there's, shell, there's a little bit of shell fragment around the outside. Oh, like this? Yeah, that's, uh, oh, and those are the sutures on the inside um, that have been, there's been a little bit oh, of cool. rock filling in. Yeah, I don't know if we can see that very well. Um, but you can see, so, you know, uh, uh, portions of the, the structure of the organism are, are preserved. And what's so great about this is, you know, this is literally a way for us to see what used to live in the past. Mm -hmm. It can, you know, think, mm -hmm. information about uh, creatures from the present can inform us about creatures from the past, but then those creatures from the past can inform us about what life would have been like at the time, what the environment would have been like at the time. Mm -hmm. This is how we're going to recreate dinosaurs. And, and that's the other thing. Is that, Jurassic is that, Park. Right, right, yeah, yeah exactly. My, uh, mosquitoes caught inside of amber. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I just have a couple more here. Uh, this is a brachiopod, uh, which is just a, a type of seashell. You can pass it around, you can see pretty obviously that it's a seashell, but it's been all remineralized. And then this one I love, this is a soft-shell turtle shell or tortoise shell. Oh, cool. Um, 
So really pretty, but again, <coughs> fairly simple looking. Were most of these found here, or are they from all over the um, place? All over uh, Utah, Colorado, and Wyoming, okay. um, which are the main places that my roommate works as a paleontologist. So this is m proof that Colorado at one time had uh, was underwater. At some yeah, point. yeah, and, and Colorado, uh, uh, the area that is today Colorado, used to be part of what's called um, the Intercontinental Seaway, which is a large sea area that covered most of what is today the central United States. And we have a lot of uh, marine fossils in those areas uh, that show that. Um, OK, so uh, if we could maybe get the fossil fossilized thing back, I'm going to start putting these away. Um, so but you have them all labeled, too. Yeah, I, I had them all labeled. I'm, I'm sort of messing it up now. Here. <laughs> what you Your roommate's going to be so mad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, it's fine. She doesn't need the label. She can just look at them and know exactly what Yeah. <laughs> All right. Put them back in the right spot. Yeah. Oh. oh, oh, thanks, Becky. Yeah, could you put that over there? Yes. Um, so, you know, one of the big things with fossils, though, that I was trying to point out is that there's a lot of that remineralization. There's a lot of this, you know, where the structure of a living creature is replaced by rock. And the shape of the creature still exists, so we can still see just what the shape was, but the actual material has been replaced with some kind of a, a rock piece, right? Mm -hmm. So when we think about fossil demos like the one that we're doing, it's really, it's much harder to create that reality of fossils. It's much easier to create that, hey, we just made a cast of this creature, right? Uh, mm -hmm. a, a, a fossil that just shows the shape of it on the outside. But it's not as though the chocolate is really going to replace the gummy worm Right, right, and leave us with like a chocolate gummy worm. And so that's sort of the, the thing about these demos is that there's a limitation. Oh, and here's my producer here. Oh man, you guys, I don't know if it's solidified enough for us to go ex excavating, but it's I think. Still edible though. I think, yeah, we can probably <laughs> eat it. So let's see, how, how solid are we here? Uh, uh, uh. The edges are getting solid. Oh, that's so gooey. That's so gooey. Okay, well this is what we're gonna have to do. We will leave it here for now, and then if I have an opportunity, later in the show and it solids up. I'll try to break you off a little piece of uh, ancient landscape. And we can try to see if there's some fossils in there, okay? Sounds good. All right, cool. Well, sorry yeah. I couldn't show you the end of that there, uh, but hopefully we'll get a chance to on the show. Mm -hmm. um, we'll see you back in the Homework Hotline studio in just a couple minutes. Welcome back. Hopefully you enjoyed our experiment. Uh, we will, of course, show you. Yeah, we'll try to show you the end result. We're getting, we're getting solid here. The, uh, the lava is lithifying as we speak. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. So then we'll be able to see it afterwards. So. All right, well, in the meantime, um, actually, let me give you our contact information one more time, just in case you're just joining us. We'll give you that so you can send us your questions to tackle. Um, you definitely can call us, that phone number up above the screen, but then you can also send your questions to Michael at Facebook or Twitter at EG Homework. You could text us at 970-680-3771, or you could email us at homework at emilygriffith.edu. Um, that being said, let's also get the trivia question, Michael. So mm. just to give our viewers a chance to answer, what is it? Yes, of course. So the trivia question is, what African country served as the setting for Tatooine in Star Wars? And there's a clue on below that question. So if you mm. do have an answer to it, give us a call, or you can get it in touch with us via social media. And as Michael mentioned earlier, we do have symphony tickets as a prize. All right, let's go back to the questions. All right. Looks like a geometry question. Looks like a very happy guy here. Uh -huh. uh, in the figure below, AB is a diameter of the large circle. The center, C1 and C2 of the smaller circles are on AB. The two small circles are congruent and tangent to each other, and the larger circle is the circumference of the circle. C1 is 8 pi. What is the area of the large circle? I'm guessing this is an SAT question because they gave you the answers below. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, those SAT questions. It's coming up. Yeah. It's always a little tricky. And I will say, like, this problem looks really complicated because of all the terminology in it. And just it's like a paragraph, right? And it's really mm -hmm. just asking the area. I will tell you, though, that um, a lot of this stuff is in there because you can't write some of these geometry problems without being very specific and making things very clear. One of the really important things about math in general, and I would say almost especially geometry when you look at these figures, is you cannot make assumptions. Mm -hmm. um, Even if, if it looks like it's 90 degrees, it may not be. Exactly. Or if these circles look like the same size, we mm -hmm. can't assume they are, or if they look like it's tangent. So, a lot of this information is just verifying that you can solve it the way that you were taught, um, or that there is a method. Because if we didn't have 
let's say, um, where we are, where are we? If we didn't know that they were congruent and tangent, then you could argue you can't solve this problem. Mm -hmm. um, you could argue, like, I can give you an estimate, I can give you something close, but I can't solve it. Um, so again, all of this is very intimidating, but just kind of skim through it um, and think about what the problem is actually asking. And in the end, what we really want to know is just the area of the large circle. So I always like to start out with these by kind of skimming the problem, like I said, you know, what information is going to be important to me. Um, and, and then I like to really focus on what the question is asking. And in my head, I usually work backwards on this. Um, so what is the area of the large circle? So what I'm going to do first is think, well, what do I know about area of circles? Well, I know the area of a circle is pi r squared. So I'm going to go ahead, and you may see this notation sometimes where you see uh, a little sub subscript from small letters here. I put area, I put large in small letters there, uh, subscripted, because I want to remember that this is what I'm going to use it for, the large circle. Um, now, in order to find this, the reason why I like to write this equation down before I even start plugging anything in is because it helps me identify what I need. And ultimately, I need to know the radius. If I knew the radius, the problem's easy. I just plug it in, and then I'm done. Um, and now, in order to know the radius, we have to use some of the other information given to us. Obviously, that's not given, so we have to look at other information. So I skim this again. A, B is a diameter. So I know that this right here is all the way across, and it's right through the center of the circle, so that helps me out. That tells me that if I knew the diameter of circle C1, I would know the radius of um, the large circle. So in my head now I'm thinking, how can I find the radius of circle C1? Um, and as you kind of skim through this again, you see the circumference of circle C1 uh, is 8 pi. So again, I'm thinking, what do I know about circumference? So I go ahead and I don't bother like plugging too much in. I just write circumference and then a little C1. That equation is 2 pi r. And I think, oh, that might be helpful because I need to know the radius. And maybe I'll be able to find that out. Um, so we use this information. Where the circle of C1 is 8 pi, or the circumference of circle C1 is 8 pi. So we kind of come back here and say, OK, this equation, this is the equation right here for circumference. Um, and I know the circumference over here. So we can substitute that value in. Um, circumference of C1 is given as 8 pi. Right? Now that's right here. And again, I just like to rewrite this equation equals 2 pi r. And then think again, all we're looking for is the radius. That's what I'm looking for. And when we have 8 pi and 2 pi, we treat those as numbers, um, because they are numbers. So we can solve like we normally would, dividing by 2 pi on each side. And I'm left with a radius of 4. Now, here's where I want to take a step back and just think about what this answer is, or what this gives me, because especially if this is an SAT question, which it looks like, um, they do this because a lot of students will now, a lot of test takers will now be like, oh, I got the radius. Let me plug it in here, <laughs> right? And then you're like, I'm good. And I'd be willing to bet one of those multiple choice answers would be that, uh, that mistake, which would be, is one of the answers 16 pi? Uh, let's find out. Um, because they set these up to make sure that you can think through these problems. Yes, it is. And reason them out. And oh, they set them up. fake answers. <laughs> yeah, so you make a mistake and you see that answer there and then like, all right, I'm good. Let me move on, especially on a time test like the SAT. But think so about. So mean. I know. But we've got to think about what you found here, right? We found the radius of circle C1. Right? We found this distance. This is 4. But we need the whole distance all the way across. Right? This is what we need because the diameter of one of the small circles is the radius of that large circle. So if I know the radius is 4, the diameter, right, the radius on all sides is 4, so the diameter of the little circle is 8. So we know the radius for the big circle, and I'll write it up here, 
is actually 8. And from here, we just go and plug this back in. And we say the area of the large circle, I'll just keep writing this little subscript, equals pi times 8 squared, or 64 pi. Which is number A, which is letter A. Letter so A, is right? In there so as well. They give you a wrong answer that's tricky, and they give you a right answer. Um, and there's probably a couple other answers that they know a lot of test takers make mistakes on, and they probably threw those in there too. So I would say with these types of problems, um, it's a little tricky. Try to think backwards, like what you're looking for, what you need, and then start thinking about other information kind of as a hint for like how you can find it. Um, and then watch out for those tricks. Read that problem again before you select that answer because almost every problem has some kind of trick to it. Yeah, they're kind of mean that way. Yeah. They really do throw those in there. How's our... Uh... So, so it's solidifying pretty well. Mm -hmm. It seems that the fatal flaw was the inclusion of peanut butter. Um, oh, there's nothing wrong with the inclusion of peanut I mean, it's, there's yeah. not going to be any problem for us. But I will say, I will say that the, the, um, the part of the landscape that was not covered in uh, sand dunes peanut butter um, did solidify pretty well. Oh, and I'm going to, yeah, here we go. Ready? Can you see? Can you see? You might even be able to see the flow of the... The flowing lava. Oh, here we go, sorry. The peanut butter portion here is a little bit uh, not totally solidified, but this portion is. And this is, this is going to be difficult to see. But I'm going to pass it over to you guys to see. I ripped out a Titanoboa, uh, okay. kind of because I wanted to do it. <laughs> uh, but also because I wanted to see how solid the chocolate was, and it left a great mold fossil okay. of the Titanoboa. It's right here, OK? And as I pass it to you, and I know this is not super exciting for people at home because you can't see it, but it just sort of has oh. the pattern of, can you see it? It's like tucked in there. Yep. And then show it to Nate. Yeah. Okay. And, and the idea would it. be, right, so you've got, you've got, this, oh, yeah. you've got this mold created by this ancient creature, right, the Titanoboa. As a paleontologist, your job would be. Angle. Oh, where is it? Can you, oh, it's right over here. Here. Yeah, it's, it's gonna be so hard to see. see in the... Oh, you can see the mold of it yeah, through the glass. Yeah, right through there. Yeah. So in any case, yeah. you can hopefully you can see the little ridged portion where the the gummy worm, the titanoboa, <laughs> was up against. Oh yeah, it's gonna taste delicious. What about this titanoboa? Well, you want to rip it out and see what it, yeah. what it does? So, um, <laughs> yeah, so uh, yeah, Becca's gonna. <laughs> Think of that, titan that titanobo there. I did it. Right, and so do we have kind of a, a mold fossil left there? Right. Can you see right there? Yeah, it's right on the glass. Oh yeah, I can kind of see it there. Ooh, can you angle up just a little? If I, if I way, angle maybe. it. Uh, no, I think if you angle up whoop. just a little. <laughs> oh, there it is. Oh, and you can see where oh. the green dinosaurs Woo. are because you can't see them. <laughs> Taking right. everybody on a ride oh, today. So, <laughs> that's so awesome. That's so right cool. there? Yeah, you can kind of see right there's there's the okay, so that's a mold fossil because that's it's cool. a it creates a negative of I'm gonna the, eat this titanoboa. Yeah, please eat the titanoboa. But it created a negative of the titanoboa. If this was a real landscape, right, uh, rock would probably uh, uh, fill in that uh, mold fossil that was made, and you would get a cast fossil that would have filled that in. And you know, millions of years later, that could be excavated by a paleontologist, and they could pull that out, and they would have to judge based on the shape that they saw. What kind of a creature was this? And they would definitely say it's a gigantic trolley worm. <laughs> <laughs> sour gummy. Trolley definitely well, a sour gummy worm. Could we hang on that on that until tomorrow? Because I understand we have somebody from Dinosaur Ridge coming. Oh yeah, we could definitely hang yeah, on. Right. The only problem with that is that, that means we don't get to eat peanut butter and chocolate and gummy. We could eat it after this. We could eat it tomorrow. tomorrow. I think we, we should. Could. Not to cut you off, but we should probably go to the trivia. Oh, please, trivia time. question. Oh, my yeah. gosh. All right. I guess I, I need to try and do social media tomorrow, too, make sure I get some of that. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, so the question is, what African country served as the setting for Tatooine in Star Wars? The answer is Tunisia. Did I say that right? Tunisia. 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 Yeah, yeah. Well, I, yeah, Tunisia. Sorry, guys. I apparently failed geography. Um, <laughs> Is maybe uh, Tunisia's maybe most famous for Star Wars, uh, Star Wars locations because it uh, was here that Luke watched the twin sun sun set in the sky, while Qui Gon battled against the Sith Lord, and making their galaxy where Anakin Skywalker and Luke both grew up. Hmm. Hmm. I know I've heard Tunisia is really beautiful. I have not been. Mm -hmm. yeah, Close ties to France. I know a lot of Tunisians speak French mm -hmm. uh, because of that. Actually, I ran into someone in France that had just traveled from Tunisia, and that's where mm -hmm. I heard I that it was beautiful. Yeah, a spot for people from France to go. Yeah. Man. Mm. Um, I'd love to go someday. Do you, do you know anything about it, Tunisia? 
Um, I do know that uh, it was one of the locations used in the filming of The Phantom Menace. See, I was assuming that Tunisia was um, Tatooine from the original L, whatever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh. Well, Tunisia is the answer. <laughs> All right. Well, if we didn't get your questions answered today, we will get back to you again tomorrow. We'll be here same time, same place, 4.30 to 5.30. Catch us live then. And thank you again for joining us. See you soon.